Okay, we'll make a start today. Right, the lecture today is in two parts. The first part is I'm going to talk to you about Ajax, XML and JSON. Primarily Ajax and JSON will touch on XML, but not very much. Um, that's for the first half hour. The second half, I want to talk to you about next year, about 305. Uh, because I think you need to know where this is leading. You need to know where this is going for next year. Very important. So what I've asked, I've asked some of my third year students to come and have a talk to you about what they're working on at the moment and what they've been doing in the third year. And that will give you an idea of the sort of skills you're going to be developing over the next 12 months. And I'll give you some context, and into, into, context to your actions. <clears throat> right, the key word here is Ajax, and this is a massive, massive important area. Um, you will do some client side work next year. It will all be Ajax based. Everything you do on the, on the, web, in the web browser will be based on Ajax next year. So this is almost like a, an introduction to what you're going to be talking about next year in much more depth. <clears throat> the idea is with Ajax, up until now, if you want to load more content into your page, you have to hit the refresh button or load a new page and it goes back to the server, it gets the data from the server, it pulls it through and displays it on the page. Okay? Now you probably notice that lots of modern web apps and websites don't do it that way. If you use Google Docs, for example, it's pulling stuff through all the time, isn't it? And saving stuff back to the server in the background without you having to do anything. There's no page refreshes going on, it's simply passing data. <clears throat> That's what Ajax is all about. And the idea is you can load data and save data without having to reload the page. <clears throat> I'm going to talk to you about that today and show you the basics. And we'll apply this to our assignment later on. Now, classic example of Ajax is the Google search engine. <clears throat> As you type into the search bar, you get this autocomplete, don't you? The options come up on the screen based on what you've typed. That data isn't in the browser. That's got to come from somewhere. <clears throat> so what this is doing is every key press that you make is sending the text back to the server and the server is searching on that text and returning a list of possible options and sending them back to the browser. If you want to implement this, it's actually not difficult because in jQuery UI, there is an autocomplete widget which allows you to achieve this sort of effect. But this is a classic Ajax where you're not refreshing the page every time. <clears throat> It's used in lots of apps. It's used in Gmail. Your new email comes in, it just comes in the background and appears on your list. Google Maps, you can pan around, can't you? It loads new tiles onto the, uh, into the screen as you move around the maps without having to go back to the server for every single screen refresh. YouTube, <clears throat> you've probably seen uploading videos, dragging and dropping videos to upload them. And comments, they just feed in using Ajax. And Facebook, chat, Facebook, uh, your, your, Facebook, your, your Facebook profile is all done through Ajax. So everything you really do in a professional sense is going to be using this Ajax technology. <clears throat> but to understand Ajax, you have to understand the basics of web design, which is what we've been doing this year. So this is the point where we're going to now move forward. <clears throat> now we're going to get data back from the server in some shape or another. And generally there are four formats that you can get data back in. The simple way is you could technically retrieve a CSV file. You could send a request out, load some data from a CSV file in the background, break it apart and display it in the table on your page, for instance. And that's, that's done in some apps. <coughs> you can even have a chunk of HTML which gets loaded into the DOM. Remember the DOM? You could load have HTML chunks. Okay. <laughs> Drilling holes in the ceiling. So the idea is you could have a chunk of HTML on the server, load it in and insert it into a div that's on the page. Yeah, that's quite also quite, quite viable. <clears throat> but normally the data comes in one of two main formats. One of them is XML, which is actually not used very much anymore, not used as much as it used to be. XML is a bit like HTML, but the tags are the data names. So if you had a book as an XML document, you might have a book tag, and inside the book tag you might have a title tag, an author tag, a year tag, an ISBN tag. You see what I mean? So you're structuring the data using tags. <clears throat> But it kind of looks like HTML with the same opening and closing brackets. The most popular format, though, is something called JSON, JSON. And almost every AJAX request you do is going to return some form of JSON data. So we're going to look at that in a lot more detail in this session. <clears throat> Who's come across JSON before? Little, no? None at all. Right, so this is all completely new to you. JSON is massively popular, especially now we've got smartphones and 3G networks, and you'll see why in a minute. 
<clears throat> Here's a really simple way of demonstrating Ajax. Okay, now let's look carefully at the code and let's see what's going on because if we understand this bit of code, the rest of it will make a lot more sense. Can you see I have a button and in my document ready, I've got a button click event handler. Can you see that? That's the first two lines of my code. I've also got a div with an ID of div1. Okay, so I've got an ID of, of div1 and I'm using the load method. And all the load method does, it loads a file from wherever you specify. It could be a local file system, it could be a website, and loads it into that element. So instead of saying uh, old content, whatever's in that uh, demo test.txt file will get inserted into that, div, into that div tag when you click the button. Okay, now think about what's going on here. You click the button, the JavaScript is sending the request back to the server, the server returns the data. We haven't got to load the page again. So you could have lots of these sections on a page and load each one independently. Okay, <coughs> if that text file changed, you could create a loop, which once a minute would check the text file and reload the content to the text file once a minute. And that's how the chat room sort of works. Okay, you're just checking on, you're, you're polling on a regular basis back to the server to see if there's any, any new content. So if you can understand how that works, the rest of it is just sort of garnish, it's just extra detail. So load is the simplest way to load fragments of content into our page without having to go back to the server. <clears throat> okay, so now we talk about something called a web service. And again, in 305, we're going to talk in great depth about web service. In fact, you're going to build your web service. You're going to build an API, your own custom API in 305. Okay, it's complicated, it's hard, but you will do it. It's one of the first assignments. <clears throat> the idea is a web service is like a series of functions. You know when you, when you work in Python and you have a function, you can call a function and it returns some data to you. You've done that before, haven't you? You've created your functions last term. So you create a function called get some stuff. You call a function and it returns some stuff to you. Well, a web service is a web-based function. A web service is you send a request to the web service and tell it what you want. You pass the parameters and the web service returns some data to you. So the examples I've got, I've got a special object called genre on my web service. And when I make a call to this genre web service object, it gives me a list of all the genres in, a, in my book database. So the idea is a web service is machine readable content. And the idea is you, your program, your JavaScript, gets the data and does something with it. <coughs> now, <coughs> What it really is behind the scenes is not, not complicated at all. You all you've done requests and responses, haven't you? You request the server for a web page for your website and it sends you back your web page, doesn't it? You get your HTML and your CSS and your JavaScript that you built your website up. The only difference is it's just like a website, it works in exactly the same way. You send a request to a URL and the web server sends you back the contents of the URL. The big difference is the data it returns is not human readable. It's machine readable. So your code can load that data and do something with it. Okay, so there's no style sheets, there's no HTML, there's no JavaScript. It simply returns the data that you want to work with. So it's a website that returns all the data without any style or any structure, or sorry, without any style, without any HTML. That makes sense. And that's what you're going to be building next year. <clears throat> now, the, I've got a sample web service API, which I introduce to you next year. I've put a short link to it on the slide, so you can have a look at that and kind of get to grips with how it works. Now, JSON, the most, one of the most important acronyms on the internet, and therefore in the world. If there is no JSON, there's no mobile web apps, and there's no smartphone apps. It's the most important data format ever invented. So it's really important you understand how JSON works. And like all formats, it's incredibly simple in concept, but when you look at the examples, the examples can seem, can seem rather overwhelming. <clears throat> Basically, it represents data, strings and numbers, and you can organize that data into arrays and dictionaries. Now, you know what an array is? Remember what arrays were from last term? Yeah, see with the same item repeated in the, in the variable, you know, index 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. Do you remember what a dictionary was from last term? 
You do Python. Python has dictionaries. What's a dictionary? It's not quite. It's close. You're very close on that one. It's key value pairs. It's where each value has a string, a label attached to it. And if you want the value, you specify the label and it gives you the value. Like a lookup table. So I might have a, so the key might be name, the value might be mark. So if I want to get the value marker, I say give me the dictionary object with a key of name. So it's kind of a bit like databases, isn't it? It's, 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 it's a similar idea to databases. <coughs> so let's have a look. I've got an example here, which is coming from that bookshop web service. And it contains both primitive data, strings and numbers, and it organizes them into arrays and dictionaries. Okay, ready? I have to put it on its own slide because there's quite a bit to it. <clears throat> now, that is JSON data being sent down and formatted. So that's what a web service sends you. The problem is, by default, there's no new line characters. So it's one long string of sort of um, James Joyce style narrative, just one, one long block. That's just formatted nicely so you can see it. Without this format, there'll be no smartphone apps, there'll be no web services, there'll be no web two. Okay, so understanding this is absolutely essential to understanding how the, um, how, how the internet communicates. Let's look at the first character. It's very clever because it's very concise. It doesn't waste any bandwidth. If you've got XML, you've got big tag names, haven't you? Opening and closing tag names, which is lots of, takes up space and bandwidth. <clears throat> that little curly bracket means dictionary. That's all it does. A curly bracket means dictionary and a square bracket means array. That's it. That's all you need to know because the rest of it is obvious. Look, inside the dictionary, the first key is status. You see that? And that key contains a string value, success. The next key is called bytes and that contains an integer value. You see that? The next key is called self-link <coughs> and that contains a string which just happens to be a link, a web link, a URL. The fourth key though, what does that contain? The key called genres. It contains an array. The fourth key contains an array. And how many indexes are there in this array? Look carefully. I've tricked you by, by not having sequential numbers. How many items are in that array? Look carefully. Where does the square bracket end? At the bottom. Right, so look inside the square bracket. What do you see? What's the next character? No, before you even get to the, the first character after the array starts. And it's, dictionary. it's a dictionary, right. So the first item in the array is a dictionary. You see? And how many index, how many keys has that dictionary got? Four. You see? So I've got a dictionary inside an array. How many dictionaries are there inside this array? Two. So I've got this array contains two indexes. Each index contains a dictionary. You can nest this as deep as you want to create the structures. So can you see how with minimal formatting, so I've got quotes, colons, square brackets and curly braces, I can describe almost any data structure I want to describe, any complexity. And because it's single, simple, single characters to describe the structure, it's not adding much data to the bandwidth, is it? It's much more efficient, quite an efficient use of, of bandwidth. There's almost no additional syntax in there at all. So let's sort of think about that for a minute. In the dictionary, do you notice how each dictionary entry is separated by a comma? You see that? Look at the first one. After state of success, there's a comma. You see that one? But after the last dictionary entry, entry which is the genres array, there's no comma. So each of the dictionary entries is separated by a comma, but there's no comma at the end. <clears throat> and that's a JSON response. That's data coming back from our call. That's our response. So let's have a go at calling this for real. OK, I'm going to call that exact same web service call using JavaScript and jQuery. Now, as you can see, it looks complicated, but let's try and break it down a tiny bit and see if we can understand what's going on here. The first two lines are the same, aren't they? That's just the click. And the first thing, just make sure it, the DOM loads before it, before it loads. Then I'm declaring a variable. Can you see that? URL. I've done that so it makes my code easy to understand. And then I've got this dollar dot get, and that's the magic function that does the request. It's making a get request. In other words, it's asking for some data. 
Now, can you see there are two parameters? The first one is our address, where we want the data to come from. The second one is a function. And all the function returns is the data, and the data is literally the JSON data. That data can, variable contains everything from that request, from that response, in one variable. And the, after the comma is your status. You know the 404, 300, 200, you know the standard eight, uh, web response codes? That contains our response code. So if it's equal to 200, we know we've got the data. If it's equal to 404, what's, hmm? It's no, it's not found. You can't find the resource. So we've got a nice easy way of testing to make sure the data's there. It's been successful. And all I do to start with, I don't display anything on the page at all. I simply console.log. And that will send it. Remember the JavaScript console I showed you two weeks ago? It dumps the whole lot into the console. Why do I do that? Exactly. I can check to make sure it's returned the data I want it to return. Before I start trying to break it apart and you make use of it, I want to be damn sure that data exists. Otherwise, I'm wasting my time, aren't I? So if I look at the console, that's what I see. Object is the JavaScript name for dictionary. So you can see it's returned a dictionary. <coughs> and in there, there's an array, can you see, with 27 indexes in this case. And each index contains an object, in other words, a dictionary. You see this? And I've expanded the first node so you can see what's going on. So that when I run that request, that gets dumped to my log, my, console, my JavaScript console. So I can drill into it and make sure I can, I've got the data I want. That proto object, ignore that. That's just the parent class of the object. It's, it's just nothing. It doesn't matter. What it's done, though, do you notice it's changed the order? It's alphabetical now. Look, you've got um, bytes at the top, then genres, then self-link and then status at the bottom. And you see, it's, it's slightly messed with the order on this one. But that is the DOM object. That is the DOM object that represents that JSON data. So what I can now do, I've got to extract the bits of data I want. So I need to show you how you can pull out stuff out of dictionaries and arrays and use it and display it in variables. OK, that's the key here, isn't it? The data exists. We need to pull it out and extract the bits we want. <coughs> Ignoring the proto entry, OK, the first one, can you see? We've got a dictionary object. And we now know it contains an integer value. It contains two strings. And it contains an array. Agreed? Happy with that? Well, what we can do now is we can extract some data. Look at the syntax, look how easy it is to extract the data. I have a dictionary called data. I have a key called bytes. I have a key called status. And I have a third key called self-link. Can you see using the dot notation, I can extract those values from that data object. And then I can simply console log the contents, console log any of the variables to make sure they contain the right thing. So I've got this hugely complicated data structure and I'm actually pulling out bits of data, individual strings and numbers, yeah, into variables, then I can, I can insert them, can't I? I can use uh, uh, .html in my, J, in my uh, jQuery, can't I, to insert them into different places on the page. So this is a book, a book summary. I might have uh, the front cover might be a, a URL. I could extract that and put it inside an image tag, couldn't I, on the page <coughs> to display the correct image. The title would be a string, so I could extract the title and put it inside the P tag on my page, yep, using my jQuery selectors. <coughs> but let's see what we're going to do. Right, there you are, look. So there's my code, console.log status value str1. And there you are, look. After my object gets printed, there's my status value success. And there, that's a good one to start with because it shows we've been successful. We've pulled the data out and we can display it. OK, <clears throat> can you see how this is working? Can you see how it's a, it looks complicated to start with? But in actual fact, once you get into it and you start looking at the data structures, it's quite easy to tease the data out of it. The next challenge, though, <clears throat> is to modify the DOM, to insert that value into the page. 
Yes, we need to insert it into the page so the user can see it. Well, there's my HTML I had before with a P tag and an ordered list. Okay, it's my nice little uh, HTML page and a button. So I'm saying the selector is ID of div1 P. So I'm, I'm identifying the P tag under the div1 and I'm saying .html and I'm passing the variable <clears throat> and it drops it straight into the page. So you click the button and by magically it just appears. No screen, no page refresh, no nothing. Okay, so we're using what we learned in the first week about the DOM and we're learning what we did in the second week with all the events and we're understanding how we use the variables that we've extracted from the, uh, from the JSON object. <clears throat> okay, here's a nice little example of how we go through the array, look. That's a for each loop in JavaScript. Got this callback again, look. Dollar each, there's the jQuery. Genres, there's my array. Okay, because I've said var genres equals data genres. So I've taken the value out of the um, genres key, which is the array. And I'm looping through one at a time. The index is the index number of the array. So it'll go from 0 to 26. And the value is the contents of that index, which is a dictionary, isn't it? Which is why I've had to put value dot title in the console.log. Do you see what I mean? I, put console, I, put, I couldn't just put value in because value is the dictionary, isn't it? That contains more than one value. So I've extracted the title from that index <clears throat> and I'm console logging it. So what I end up with is that. Okay. I've got a nice little, uh, in my console log, I've got every single category, every single genre displayed <coughs> yeah, in the console log. So I'm almost there. Now you're probably wondering why I put those OL tags in there, remember the ordered list, and they're empty. What am I going to do, do you think? What's going to happen next? I've got a pair of ordered list tags poised, sitting there on the page. What's going to go in those? Come on, anyone. What's going to go in the, what's I going to insert into the ordered list? What's the obvious thing? Ordered. Yeah, well, that whole list, all the items. I'm going to add those to the list. <clears throat> so we're going to display the titles in a numbered list on the web page. So when I click the button without refreshing the page, it will display success and list all the genres from my web service without having to go back to the server. <clears throat> and there we are. That's it. That's the only bit of code that you need to, need to know about. A special function called append. And I've said, my selector is div1 ol, which is my ordered list, isn't it? So there's my DOM node, which is the ordered list, and I'm appending these list items to the end of to this, to this node. And what I end up with, can you see that? When I append, I've got the list item tag, I've got the um, value.title, and I'm closing the list item tag. So, that will display it, but I've got a question for you. See if you understand what we've done so far. If I click, keep clicking that button, what's going to happen to the page? So what will happen to the list? Right, so what's going to happen at the moment? Yeah, it'll keep appending, won't it? It's the end of this list over and over again. So I could have the same items repeated. Okay, if we end up appending the item multiple times, that's bad, isn't it? We don't want that to happen. So the list gets longer and longer, becomes less and less useful, and there's no way to clear it. There we are. There's a special function called empty. And that empties the DOM element. Whatever DOM element it happens to be. It could be a heading one, it could be a... It just clears the content out. <clears throat> so now, before I go into the loop, I'm clearing my list. Then the loop will just regenerate it. And it's so fast, there's not even a flicker. You hit the button, and it looks like nothing's happened. Yeah, but it's so quick, you don't even notice it happening. So that's a way you can refresh the content without it keep appending to the end, again and again and again. <clears throat> now, Simon Task 4, let's, let's, uh, that's, that's all I want to tell you about, uh, about um, Ajax, because I want you to play with things. So Task 4, <clears throat> you've got to demonstrate you can use Ajax on your website. Demonstrate. It's a playground, it's a sandpit for you to play in to try and, and, try and achieve something. Okay, so your challenge 
for this last task is you've got to find a web service that relates to your website. So I've, I can find books, films, book, uh, DVDs, music, everything else. They're all out there somewhere and I'll show you how to find them. So here's some starting points. <clears throat> There's the first one's books. Uh, iTunes, is a, the, iTunes has an API, that's how obviously the iTunes app works, to search, retrieve, order, select music and films. So that's quite a big one. <clears throat> Rotten Tomatoes has an API for films. All the review data comes out from there. Uh, the MovieDB is another nice database for movies. And there's all these resources. There's thousands of these out there. The suggestion I make is just use Google. The last one, I simply search for RESTful API. RESTful is the, te is the technology we're using. API, JSON, and then whatever you're looking for. And in the first 10 results will be 10 different APIs you could use in your website. And now you understand how JSON data works, you've, uh, you've got a good starting point. <clears throat> now, persevere with it. It takes a while to get your head around it. Even when you get it working, sometimes you have to register for a key, a special uh, token for it to work. Read the documentation carefully. Try things out. If it doesn't work, keep persevering with it. Keep trying. And also remember, when it does work, don't, uh, don't try and put stuff straight in the web page. Log stuff to make sure things are working the way you expect them to. <laughs> Consult log things, expand the nodes, see what's there. Um, okay, now, had a few issues. Okay, this is what's coming out of the lab sessions. I don't know what to do. <coughs> I don't understand. Okay, classic statements from the lab sessions. I don't get it. I don't know what we're doing. And I've spoken to the lab supervisors. We have our week, a weekly meeting. And what they've said, they've seen people just simply randomly copying and pasting like random lines of, of uh, JavaScript code and then looking surprised when it doesn't work. You've got to understand the terminology. You've got to understand the DOM, the concepts that we're work, working with. It doesn't want to work if you, if you don't understand the concepts. Perspective. You're on an undergraduate degree, a BSc undergraduate degree in a computing related field. It means in six months you could be on work placement, working for a company, expected to do this sort of work. If you decide to do the third year, you could be in a full time job in 15 months. If you walk into a job with that sort of attitude, you will last a week. You've got to persevere. If it's hard, Yes, it's hard, you get on with it. If you don't get much sleep when you're learning the technologies, I don't get much sleep when I'm learning technologies. I get on with it, I dive into it, I explore it. I Google things I don't understand, I try and figure things out. You can't get through life by just simply whining and, wh and whinging about things not working. You've got to have some initiative. You're not at school anymore, we don't spoon feed you in this university, or at least I hope we don't. <clears throat> These are the foundation skills you'll need to get a job. Now, another, another perspective here is we have applied research at this university. In the computing field, I'm involved in almost every single applied research project in computing. That's because 95% of work that takes place in industry is based around the web. The internet is, the, is the, one of the foundation stones of modern business. Whether you're a BIT student, computing or computer science, the, the internet is so important. If machines are going to talk together, so when you place your order with Amazon, Amazon can place your order with their suppliers, machines need to be able to talk to each other over the web. The only way for this to take place is to use web services. And that's what we teach in the third year. And just on cue, here come my third year students. Come on in, guys. Now, <clears throat> come on, guys. Perfect timing there. Right, do you want to come down and... Uh, what I want to talk to you about now, and for the last sort of uh, 20 minutes or so, is kind of set the scene on what's happening next year. What's happening on your course next year. Um, let me just put the list up. I looked at the 305 module. That's who's studying 305. If you're doing computing, creative or multimedia, it's mandatory. If you're doing BIT or computer science, it's optional. Okay? Now, when I say optional, if you want to get a job in the computing sector and you don't understand APIs, yeah, 
you don't stand a chance. Yeah, this, the subjects we cover in the third year are pretty much fundamental to the way the internet works. 